Thank you, Member. The Member for Oak Bay, Gordon Head. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. It gives me great pleasure to rise to speak to this budget, Budget 2017. Before I start, please let me acknowledge the years of service that the former P Premier, Christy Clark, gave to the Legislature. It is not without pers great personal sacrifice that someone serves as Premier of our province, and for that I would suggest all British Columbia should be thankful and honoured that she served in such a, such a way. It <laughs> Now, I recognize that, that I'm sitting on the other side of this legislature here, but I wish the speaker to know that I do remain in opposition, although we have come to an agreement through the Confidence and Supply Agreement with the BCNDP to support a BCNDP-led minority government. Please let me offer some highlights as to how we got there and how, why I'm speaking in strong support of this particular budget. In the last election, the BC Green Party ran by offering British Columbians a vision on which to build a growing economy in the 21st century. We ran on ensuring that the health and well-being of British Columbians was put first and foremost in decision-making. We ran on building a sustainable economy, and we ran on strengthening trust in a government. In essence, we ran on a slogan of change you can count on, and I would argue it's turned into change you can count on for a better BC. The platform we presented this past spring articulated our philosophy, our vision, and the actions that we believed could enrich the lives of all British Columbians. We were enthusiastic about an innovative and sustainable private sector, sector and we know that the health and well-being of British Columbians is inextricably, inextricably linked to the economy. We believe that government should ensure that people are not just a, fact, a factor of production, working for the economy, but rather that the economy is working for people. We recognize that life is getting harder for many British Columbians, and we believe there is another way forward, one where people enjoy economic security in the new and emerging gig economy, our pro one where the, our province's resources are managed sustainably, and one where equity is a fundamental value of government that operates in the best interests of this generation and future generations. The BC Green platform set out a bold plan to achieve this vision. It was grounded in economic security and sustainability in the full and truest sense, we would argue, and it provided clear steps based on evidence to move us towards greater well-being for all British Columbians. If we're going to make BC a more prosperous place for all people, not just those who already it is prosperous for, but all people. We need to eliminate the fear of income insecurity, which has debilitating impacts on people's health and well-being. We need to take a, a, our role as stewards of the environment seriously, and we need to reset the relationship between people and government and communities and government, and we need to embrace the new economy and take measures to ensure that we all share in the benefits and that no one is left behind. This is what we ran on. But, Honourable Speaker, we didn't form a majority government. Honourable Speaker, the BC Liberals ran on a different platform. Honourable Speaker, they did not form a majority government. And the BC NDP on ran on something different. Honourable Speaker, they did not receive a majority government. All parties presented different ideas that resonated with some people, not all people, but some people and some communities, not all communities, but some communities. And none of us clearly had the right mixture to encapture a majority of British Columbians. And that was indicated in the election results. Instead, we have before us a minority government, one that I truly believe has the potential to be far more than the sum of its parts if, Honourable Speaker, parties choose to work together. We have something to offer on behalf of all British Columbians that voted for each of our visions for this province. We have a lot of shared priorities. And as the throne speech, the one that was produced in the summer shows, there's a lot of commonality in these shared priorities. And as we saw today, Honourable Speaker, through the introduction of legislation from the, in a private member's motion, we see an emergence and, a, and an agreement in the general principles of eliminating big, big money in BC politics. And I think there's lots of commonalities there that we can build upon. And no one party will have all the solutions. 
but together we might be able to represent our different constituencies and work towards good public policy if we truly want to put good public pol policy front and centre in, its, in our decision-making instead of partisanship. You know, I think this budget is actually a great example of starting that in the right direction. It includes initiatives from all three parties. It was built, fundamentally, this budget was built on the foundation of the BC Liberals' February budget. And it retains a number of the very positive aspects of that February budget, such as the $20 million in funding the Liberals had announced for 4,100 new childcare spaces in February. It also includes some important ideas from the ND, uh, some important NDP priorities, like the $291 million investment to build uh, and the $170 million additional investment to operate 2,000 new modular housing units for, homeless, for the homeless. This is a good initiative. And it features also some BC Green-led initiatives, like the importance of the emerging economy through the creation of an emerging economy task force and an innovation commission, and through recognition that it's important to get politics out of minimum wage price setting and to the create a fair wage commission much akin what exists in Australia, to have make recommendations to government on the path towards setting minimum wage. $15 by 2021 was the BC NDP platform. The BC Green platform was to actually put it to the, in, uh, the Fair Wage Commission and also to actually move towards the concept of basing income. What we have in this confidence and supply agreement is a recognition that the B for the BC NDP, $15 is an important number. I understand that. We understand that. But why by 2021? Why not perhaps consider other alternatives? Why would perhaps an independent commission not explore options after engagement with stakeholders about perhaps a system whereby the minimum wage might actually be different in Metro Vancouver relative to, say, the region of Port Hardy? just making two states up, but one might be more appropriate in Penticton to have a minimum wage that's slightly uh, different from the minimum wage in Burnaby. This is something that we should let a, a Fair Wage Commission explore to make recommendations to government, the ultimate decision maker. I think this is what bulls, a bold step forward, but only would happen as we brought together and came together to share our ideas. You know, working with the BCNDP over the past several months, uh, has been a meeting of these ideas, I would argue, and going forward, I hope that the BC Liberals also share this importance too, particularly in light of the fact, and I'll come to that, I see the, uh, the member from uh, Prince George Vielma look at me oddly, I, I would like to recognize that this did work as well, and the Prince, jo uh, Prince George Vielma member knows full well that I thoroughly respected working with her and continue to do so on issues there. I think we have a lot of commonalities here, but you know, what we have to do is we have an election coming up. Sorry, not an election, a referendum. <laughs> with, with respect to my colleagues on this side of the House, that was clearly, clearly, clearly a slept. We have, a, we, <laughs> we have, a, well, we do have a by-election coming up. We have a, we have a, <laughs> we have, <laughs> uh, the member's opposite got very, very excited, Honourable Speaker, over that slip up. We have a referendum coming up on the issue of proportional representation. Now, I've, I understand there's a diversity in views in this House. There's a diversity of views in the general public. But wouldn't it be fascinating to show this province that a minority government can work by building on the uh, good ideas from all political parties in the lead-up to a referendum on proportional representation? You know, I'd like to look a little bit further on some of the budget highlights, just to bring a focus on some specifics that I would like to applaud, and some that I will say we don't agree with. You know, the budget provisions for education, childcare, affordable housing, and essential services are long overdue. Now, I recognize, in speaking with members opposite, and in listening to the throne speech, that the BC Liberal Caucus heard that message loud and clear and came to us in the summer with the revised version of what we had expected to hear in a throne speech. They heard that from the people of British Columbia, particularly the people of the Metro Vancouver region, which is hurting in, because of the affordability issue. The, those on the government side have also heard that 
and need to pay heed to the concerns of those in Metro Vancouver suffering under the issue of affordability. You know, I'm also delighted to see the implementation of a pathway towards the elimination of MSP. This has been an initiative we've been championing on the BC Green Caucus, well, the caucus was very small up until now, for the last number of years. And the first approach using the BC Liberal budget of February was to cut them by half this year, something we can all get behind. It was in the BC Liberal budget, the BC NDP have agreed to it, we support it. If we believe that we want to work on our commonalities and build upon that which we disagree with, we agree upon, the disagreements, of which there are some, are considered minor. And I continue with this to show how the CASA agreement came to be. I'll be straight up honest, honest Honourable honor, honor, Speaker. After four years in opposition, and it was tough times going there with the rest of the opposition, after an election campaign that I would describe as quite ugly and personal to me by the government now, I didn't think it would be very easy for me to see a way that we could come together, Honourable Speaker. I did not see that. But since the meetings, the face-to-face -face meetings, with the finance minister and the premier, I see just how much we have shared in terms of our commonality, our vision, and how we want to put good public policy and people first. And I will say that the working relationship that the small BC Green Caucus has with the existing government has been nothing short of exceptional. And for that, we are very, very grateful. You know, I can like to go on and talk about a few more budget highlights that I think are important. I'm a big fan of living within your means. I applaud the BC Liberals' fiscal prudence in terms of producing balanced budgets. Now, I recognize that there's some question as to how the budget was balanced in terms of priorities being made, increasing rate hikes versus personal tax rates, for example. But the fiscal prudence that was brought to British Columbia is something that I'm hoping, and we see in this budget, will be preserved under the present government, where a, for, a surplus budget to the tune of 246 million, uh, sorry, the surplus budget, uh, 246 million dollars, is is projected for March 31st, 2018, with a 300 million dollar contingency built in as, as well. You know, the budget also plans to increase wealthy corporations and polluters while providing more money for homelessness, rental housing and the overdose crisis. Now I recognize the manifesto from the, minister, from the member from Chilliwack Kent, the manifesto for the new leader of the BC Liberal Party actually asks about a pathway to eliminate corporate income taxes, but frankly I think this neoliberal approach that if taxed them bad has had its day. We saw that federally, where the B federal Liberals won an over uh, a, a, a strong majority that no one expected, because they recognized that this neoliberal approach that if corporation then right, if tax then wrong, has actually led to a dis an income in disparity between those who have and those who haven't, which is not a healthy situation for any society to be in. And we see in this budget steps taken to start to mitigate that. Moving from 11 to 12 percent 12 in corporate income tax rate is not something that's going to create a big upset in, in, in corporate Canada. You know, we heard some threats and fear mongering on the opposite side. I know many, many CEOs in many corporations in Canada, and to be quite frank, we're one of the lowest, 11 to 12 percent. They want to pay their share. If they pay their share, they are concerned that government uses their money in, in a manner that's fiscally prudent. They want, they want to have a stable environment. It's not healthy for anybody when you have a homeless situation in Vancouver. It's not helpful for anyone when there's ongoing tension between indigenous rights and title, local communities and corporations. Nothing gets done. It's critical that you start to value people, build from the bottom up to develop a society that actually corporations want to be part of. And we see that emerging in this, um, in this budget through the creation of things like the Innovation Commission, the Emerging Economy Task Force, and, and, so, task force and so forth. You know, one of the things in the budget um, that we are grateful to see is the 
commitment to develop a, a pilot project on basic income. This is critical as we move towards the gig economy, where the one job, one life idea of yesteryear becomes more and more precarious. People have more and more jobs in their lifetime with gaps in between. And the concept of basic income, one which would eliminate student debt, for example, one which would eliminate the need for some programs down the road, is one that ex was experimented in, in Dauphin, Manitoba in the 1970s, and one which was shown to eliminate poverty in Dauphin, Manitoba. So we look to the poverty reduction plan being put forward during the coming months as a means and ways of identifying a pathway to the implementation of a basic income pilot project. And that's a really exciting opportunity in British Columbia. To the child care plan, the BC NDP campaigned on the $10 a day child care plan. We campaigned on a $0 a day child care plan with a change in the taxation system, together with 25 hours of early childhood education, which we know is the single most important in terms of dollar per result investment that you can make in a society for education is in those critical years where the payback is, 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 is being shown through research to be profound. That doesn't mean we don't uh, disagree, we, that these, these disagreements between the two platforms are anything other than semantics. Why $10 a day? Well, it was because of an advocacy group that spent a lot of time doing a lot of research, came up with a plan, $10 a day. But you could make the, a number 10, there's nothing wedded into it. $0 a day, $10 a day, $15 a day, why not means test it? Would the CEO of a major corporation earning half a million dollars a year really need access to a childcare system that's free? I think their ability to pay should predetermine the, the amount that they actually get. In our system, what we had approached is we had ensured that there was going to be no money, it was not a barrier to access. Right now, Honourable Speaker, if you access childcare, you pay up front, and at the end of the year, you file your income tax return, and you get a childcare tax credit. That's great. But that means you have to still pay up front. And for those struggling with affordability, that ability to pay up front is a barrier, which is why what we suggested is you wouldn't pay up front. It would be zero up front. And at the end of the year, if you so choose to take advantage of this universal day pro daycare program, and you earned over $80,000 a year, it would be viewed as a taxable benefit. So you, if you could pay, you would pay, as opposed to not being able to access the system because of your inability to make your monthly rent. Now, the economist involved in the development of the $10 a day childcare plan told us our plan was better. So why wouldn't we actually want to sit and negotiate and talk with stakeholders, and in particular, the civil service? The civil service that this government has promised to reinvigorate, to listen to the, all the ideas that are brought to the table to ensure that we build upon our shared values of the importance of universal daycare, universal childcare, and that we find the most efficient, effective ways of doing that where those who advocated on behalf of the $10 a day program have their voice. But they're not the only voice at the table. There are other voices as well. And I'm excited that this will move forward. And as we move into these discussions, we know the BC NDP will bring their $10 a day childcare program to the table. We'll bring our refined zero dollars to the table. And we'll discuss, hopefully with input from BC Liberal as well, as to how we can make this right, because we have the same shared value. And that's how good public policy is formulated. Good public policy is not taken from third-party advocacy groups and determined to be the policy. It's by using and engaging and, 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 and tasking the civil service to reflect upon the complex issues that are involved in the development of good public policy and consulting with stakeholders and using their input to, get, to, to provide evidence and support for the development. We see today a good example in question period, Honourable Speaker, where I pointed out that the Minister now walking in was quite firm in, in electioneering that we would do this right away. But it's much more complex than that, Honourable Speaker, because there are jurisdictional issues, there's legal issues, there's time frame issues, and it's a lot e more difficult to implement good public policy if you promise the world out here when you get in, it's pretty important that you get it right. And so that's what we see our role here, Honourable Speaker, in the minority government, is to we have shared values that will ensure that the, the, the fundamental principles will be supported, but we're there as a check to work together to ensure that other views also get listened to. 
and frankly, it's working very well so far, Honorable Speaker. You know, here's an example. One, it's not no surprises, but if there was, as we have in the agreement, no surprises and, and best, best practices, if there was a surprise, it wasn't really a surprise, it was a pleasant one. In our election campaign, we campaigned on injecting $4 billion over four years into the public education system to ensure that those children, those children in their early years, had accesses to the services that they require in those critical formative years, those years where, over the last 16 years, cuts have been targeted through the child psychologists, through the speech pathologists, for the in-class help for those children with special, special or, 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 or uh, alternate needs. That's where the cuts have been. And we know that if we invest in, invest, and what's important, Honorable Speaker, is I'm reiterating the word invest. If we invest in the support for our children in these critical years, we save, we get a return. We get a return when they age out and enter society because we're not having to pay for the social systems, the social crises, the things that we're dealing with now because we've provided them services when they're young. It's an investment with a rate of return that is, is difficult to quantify in, in, a, in me talking right now, but it is one that we know pays off based on, 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 on cumulative evidence over many, many years. Why I was pleased is that I saw, well, in the BC NDP platform, they had a little bit, they had quite a lot actually for rebuilding schools, but very little, very little, apart from that at basic education, something like $30 million for increased funding for the K-12 system, for the in the classroom, apart from that which was prescribed by the Supreme Court, which they agreed to implement, as of course we did. To see this injection of new money into the education system precisely in the years when it's needed is absolutely refreshing in my view and long overdue, and we're so grateful to see that there. You know, let's take a look. It was $681 million, actually. In fact, $521 million of that. $521 million. $521 million of that was to provide for improved classroom supports for children in, cap in addition to the capital funding, which was there. The, member, the former Minister of Education was, claims that that was in his budget, that $681 million. I would, If it was in your budget, I would like to give you credit for that too, and I'd like to give the NDP credit for actually continuing forward with that, because our top priority has always been public education. And they're high-fiving across the floor. Isn't this a wonderful legislation that we have here today? <laughs> We're not in a coalition. Let's, <laughs> let's come to the fentanyl crisis. Now, the fentanyl crisis is another example of where we support the funding going in. $322 million dedicated to a comprehensive response. $265 million for the Ministry of Health. $32 million to increase police resources and address pressures, uh, pressures at BC Corner Service. And $25 million to establish a Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. Some of this... I recognize was in the existing budget, but not the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions until we had the throne speech in the summer where things changed with the BC um, Liberals. You know, what, dealing with fentanyl crisis and this cost pressure here is something we'd like to see go to zero dollars. The reason why over what we're doing is we're dealing in a crisis management uh, point of view, but we haven't been thinking over recent years about two aspects of mental health and addictions. One is the issue of prevention, and two is the issue of recovery. And within our negotiations and discussions, it was so very refreshing to see shared values and shared interest in actually supporting investment in prevention and recovery with the hope that the invention in health harm reduction, in the investment in harm, in harm reduction is not needed down the road. We're dealing with hard harm reduction, and I would argue we're dealing with harm reduction costs today because of cuts to our K-12 system yesterday where children did not have the resources they needed at critical junctures, to cuts to our social services in MCFD because of children did not have the resources they needed when they were young, to cuts to, 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 to um, uh, 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 first responders and, uh, and others, to, to cuts to prevention to cuts to recovery programs. These cuts 
have created a crisis on our streets, which we're now paying for in other means. So my dream would be to see this budget item, this budget item of $322 million to a comprehensive response, go to zero over the course of four years. Because we don't want to be responding to a crisis. We want to be preventing it in the first place. And those who are in the crisis now, we want to have a pathway to get out of that crisis. And for that, I'm quite pleased with the discussions and the direction that this government is heading. Housing, again, another good example. 208 million over four years. Uh, 1,700 units of affordable rental housing, 291 over two years to build over 100, uh, and over 170 million to operate the 2,000 modular housing units. And more importantly, well, maybe not more importantly, and also importantly, is the $7 million for the residential tenancy branch to deal with the backlog of issues that are arising in that office. I don't know how many constituents have come to my office with complaint after complaint after complaint about issues arising from EA either access to the residential tenancy branch, branch or unfair decisions in terms of landlords who rent on yearly contracts, on con uh, contracts and have outrageous requirements for, for uh, taking those forward. This is another good investment that we strongly support. You know, as I said here, one of our goal goals, we believe, is coming back to the issue that Nobody won a majority government. Therefore, we must build upon our shared values to find commonalities to move forward. Is I was pleased what not to see the $400 per renter investment. And why I think I say that is there's a shared value here. We share the values with government about the importance of affordability for renting. We would agree on an investment of $200 million, which is about what it would cost to do that. But I would argue, and the BC Green Caucus would argue, that perhaps that is not the most effective way of dealing with the problem. The problem is affordability, $200 million distribution of cash with a bureaucratic overhead to administrate it, I would argue is not effective. It's akin to printing money, the Bank of Canada saying, we need people to have more money, so let's print some more money. The immediate response in economic terms is inflationary pressure which causes inflation to go up, so you need to print more money. It's not too dissimilar from what would happen by just giving out money for rent. If landlords suddenly realize that renters have more access to capital to pay the rent, in a 0% market rental rate market, all that happens is rents go up another $400. So we have to be very, very careful how we incentivize um, uh, uh, money distribution that way. I was disappointed to not see the elimination of the encouragement that the BC Liberal gave for, gave for people to irresponsibly take on more debt than they actually were able to fund, to fund through this outrageous loan program that allowed for a 0% interest loan to encourage people to burden themselves with more debt than they could afford. But hopefully down the road this may or may not be um, removed. You know, increasing the income, individual income tax rate for those earning $150,000 from 16.8% to 14.87%, while bemoaned by those opposite, and by certainly not consistent with the manifesto, the 65 manife uh, items in the manifesto from the member from Chilliwack, Chilliwack Kent for the next Liberal leader, it's exactly what people want to pay. I have talked to person after person after person in my riding and across British Columbia. British Columbians don't mind paying taxes. The neoliberal view of there's no taxes is good. It's dated, but they want to ensure that government uses their money wisely, which is why I found it very, very, very rich for this government to talk about their economic stewardship. You know, they've been very, very good at branding the BC NDP as irresponsible fiscal managers. They've been saying the same thing, and and people on the street think this. But when you look a little more carefully at their fiscal management, you've got to ask a few pointed questions. Site C Dam. Why are you using Site C Dam? Why are you using taxpayer money to subsidize industry? Their view of good economic growth is using a taxpayer money to subsidize corporate, corporate ventures. How is that free market? That's picking winners and losers in the market, Honorable Speaker. Picking winners and losers, they picked the LNG. What a big mistake that was. 100,000 jobs, 
$1 trillion increase to GDP, $100 billion prosperity fund. That's the winner they picked. And they went all in to do it. People were encouraged to build hotels in terrace that are empty. Thank they were you. encouraged to, to, to renovate their homes in Kitimat because of this influx of new employees. Thank that you, are Member. Empty. And I, with that, Honourable Speaker, I do thank you. I could have, I wish, I, the only thing I wish, Honourable Speaker, in conclusion, is we had official party status already because I could have talked for at least another hour and a half on this. Thank you. That's